Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have Jason Bradwell on the show. And the reason we had Jason on this week is because he is a college referee. So he's coached or refereed at the high school level, D3, D2, and now he's at the D1 level. So we really go into the ins and outs of becoming a referee, some strategies for parents, coaches, and players to think about during a game and how he views the game when he watches it. We also talked to Jason because he helped place his two sons at prep schools. And we talked about that process, how he went through it, what his due diligence was, and kind of what the deciding factors were. Finally, he runs a showcase event outside of New York, which uh, gives kids a chance to uh, do a workout and perform in front of prep school coaches looking for you know prospective kids. Uh, parents at this event also have a round table where they can talk to a prep school coach, a prep school player, um, and others. So a lot's in this episode. It's really good perspective from a parent and a referee. So I hope you enjoy it, and thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Corey. Happy to be here. Yeah, well, the one thing I wanted to get you on for um, is a plethora of reasons, but the first one is you were a D1 referee for college am, basketball. Yeah. Talk yes. to me about that. How did you get into refereeing, and how did you work your way up to the D1 level? Oh, I got into refereeing through my dad. Um, he refereed at the high school and college and at the um, the lower pro levels, like the USBL and the CBA and stuff like that. And you know, he'd been refing for a while, and trying to get me into it for a couple of years. And I just didn't want to get into it. I didn't want to deal with, you know, all the big, you know, kids and all this stuff like that. And then one year I just gave it and said, all right, I'll go, I'll take the high school class. I'll, I'll go and register and sign up and all that stuff. And I fell in love with it. Um, it's a huge passion of mine. Um, it's so much fun. Um, so I got in and I started refereeing. I did some high school basketball for a couple of years. You kind of start out, you do like, you know, like seventh and eighth grade games and, you know, which we call in New York modified basketball. And then, um, then you, then the, so I did that for like a year. Then you do some, I did some freshman and some JV games and then I passed my test and uh, got it to do varsity. I did varsity for three years. And um, in the third year of doing varsity uh, that summer, I got hired in division one and two. Um, a couple of years before that I had got hired in division three and, um, it kind of just took off from there. Really. Answer me this. You say it's fun. Now I've ref before. I, I think it's the opposite of fun. Why right. do you think it's fun? I have the best seat in the house for, to watch some of the best athletes in the game play basketball. I love basketball. I'm a basketball guy. I played basketball my whole life. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm like a career athlete. You know, I, I played sports my whole life. I was the kid that changed in the car going from one sport to the uh, next growing up so but um you know you're involved in the game and and but I try to stay out of the way as much as possible like if it's a foul it's a foul I mean it's not really it, they should call themselves it's not really you know if it's a travel then it's a travel you can't really get mad at that so you you said you got into d2 d1 like you didn't just get into it you had to pursue that right for sure for sure definitely definitely okay and what are the steps you have to take for people that because I don't know this either like going from high school games to go to the college level, walk us through that process. Sure. So what happens is every conference has a supervisor, has a referee supervisor. So they will hold their own little tryout camps, usually in conjunction with an AAU tournament or some mm -hmm. sort of team camp, something like that, where they need referees. So the referees who want to get hired pay to go to this camp. Um, and then they referee the games and they're evaluated. So there will be other observers, usually um, current referees or former referees, you know, higher level rep referees that are that um, work for the for the guy that runs the camp. Um, you know, they'll go and they'll sit on a court and they'll evaluate guys like, you know, good call, bad call, in shape, not in shape, mm. knows his mechanics, knows his rules and whatever other um, criteria that the supervisor is looking for. And then in the end, you know, it's really up to the supervisor with how many spots he or she may have 
to hire or not. And so it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of a crapshoot because they, you, there may be 60 guys at a camp and they only be maybe hiring two or three right. or one. Um, so then that's at every level. So th- that's how I got into doing junior college and how I got into doing division three basketball. And then you do that for a little while. Then every summer you're going to other uh, camps to try it, to try out when you're, when you're good enough, where you think that you're good enough to move up. And then division two, they have a camp division one, they have camps all at, so uh, Patriot league, Ivy league, Mac, America East, a 10, you know, they, they all have camps. Which conference in America is the most respected to be in as a ref? Oof. Or even one again? Would it be ACC because of Duke and UNC and all that? Or I think everybody has a regional bias. The mm. people in the Midwest think that the Big Ten is the is the best, and it's phenomenal. People in the in the Northeast think that the Big East is the best, and that's phenomenal too. You know, down, going down the East Coast, ACC, and then you go out west, that people think that the you know Pac twelve and you know, uh, you you know, further in the Midwest, SEC, you know, all of them. I think that everybody thinks that their that their conference is really the best, and they're all so good. They're all so good. So I can't pick one. Okay, gotcha. Now, what is something you want to share with coaches, parents, and players about referees that they might just get wrong a lot? What's some like insight you want to give them? Like, hey, you never thought about this, but think about this next time you see a game being called. No referee tries to get a play wrong. Nobody wants to get a play wrong. Just like no kid wants to miss a layup or a jump shot and no coach wants to call the wrong play or put the wrong sub in, nobody wants to get a travel, a foul, or whatever wrong. Um, some people, you, sometimes you just miss it. <laughs> you know, you're just, you could be in the right spot and you just miss it. Just like you're in the right spot and you shoot that jump shot and you miss or, you know, you're, it just, it just happened. Or you're in the right spot and 6'10 walks right in front of you. Mm. And you have no idea what just happened. And you hope that one of your partners grabs it for you. But maybe they were looking at something else because we're all responsible for a different area on the floor. The, the coaches and the parents have a luxury of watching the ball. We don't. Right. Right. Love that. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, nobody really wants to get something wrong. Okay, what does <laughs> you see Huggins, you see Calipari, you see Bobby Knight, all these guys that are known for being yellers pretty much the whole game of refs. And then you see players getting on refs in the NBA, especially. Does that ever help? No. Um, I think if you like there aren't too many Bobby Knights anymore. There aren't too many, um, you know, guys like that, Jim Calhoun's and those those guys that were notoriously tough. I mean, sure, Huggins is, is you know, and and Huggins, you know, I think he's his situation. He may not be out there either. But, um, you know, there aren't too many guys like that anymore. I think the game has evolved and the money has evolved and everything is recorded. And, you know, you don't want to show something off the wrong show, your show, your show, your school off the wrong way, represent your school the wrong way. But um, yeah, yelling at refs to really answer your question, yelling at refs never helps because uh, again, I know when I miss something. Yeah. I, and, and I'll tell you, Hey, I missed that play. Mm. I'm human. I don't want to do it. I can't say that four or five times per game, but you know, I'm human. I'm not perfect. And and yelling at us is not going to help. And it's different in the NBA. I think the money factor really changes, changes things because, you know, the NBA is a player's game and college is a coach's game. So you'll say LeBron James and the Lakers versus, um, you know, uh, Dwayne Wade and the Heat. But then college, you'll hear, you know, um, Roy Williams and the Tar Heels versus Coach K and the Duke Blue Devils. It's a it's it's a coach's game. So the players, they get a lot more leeway in the NBA, not as but, you know, whereas the coaches probably get a little little more leeway in uh, college. Gotcha. Now, if you're talking to players out there that are listening to this and they want to know how to start the game off right with a referee, should they come up and introduce themselves? Should they just be quiet? Should the team captain do it? Uh, should they have dialogue during timeouts? Like what what etiquette would you have a player want to follow to be in the best graces of referees as possible? Just be a good person. You know, talk to us. Ask us, hey, not every time. Hey, what did I do? 
you know, hey, did I did I hit him here? Was I pushing him here? Did I, did I do this? And then when we give you the answer, just say, okay. Because that's what we saw. And maybe we'll say, hey, you know what? I probably should have held off on that whistle. Or, you know, it looked like you dragged your pivot foot or you switched your pivot feet when you kind of did like a, you know, when you, you I called a travel because you went like this on your, on your shot fake. Okay, ref, thanks. You know, just talk to us. We're, we are human beings. Okay. That's simple. Simple advice. Yeah, simple. It's, 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 it's not hard. It's not hard, you know, but, right. and, and you can't question every single play. Yeah. That gets old too. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between coaching at the D2, D3 level to the D1 level? Or refing, I should say. I'm sorry. Um, the speed and the physicality um, is definitely different. And, and, and the size, you know, um, I mean, not as much though. The size used to be a bigger difference, but um, I would say, you know, it's, it's definitely a, you know, the centers, most of the centers, most of the bigs in D3, D2, for the most part, are, you know, somewhere in the, you know, you would say 6'6 six, six to 6'10. Six, Whereas, you know, most of the division one bigs are much bigger and they're, you know, and they're heavier and they're faster and they're stronger across the board, guards, forwards, bigs. Um, it's just a much faster game, but it's an easier game to referee because the skill level is higher. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, you go watch a fifth grade basketball game versus a varsity basketball game. It's much harder to referee a fifth grade game because you have so many things. Do I call that foul? Do I not call that foul? Do I call that travel? Do I not call that travel? Do I call three seconds? Do I call five seconds? Do I, did he just lose the ball out of bounds or did he get fouled? You know, in college, most of the stuff calls itself. And what's it like with the fan reactions? Does that ever get to you guys or can you guys just zone it out? Yeah, you pretty much zone it out. Like I tell people, you know, as a when you play, right, when you're when you're an athlete, when you play, you pretty much hear anybody courtside. The guy up in section 217 yelling, hey, ref, blah, 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 blah. Nobody can hear you. Nobody can hear. We can't hear you. So you're so you're yelling for the 30 people radius all like around you. Nobody can hear you. So, you know, it's just white noise. Um, you know, you can hear the boos, you can hear the cheers, but the personal stuff you can't really hear unless it's courtside. And those people don't really say too much because they paid a lot of money for those seats yeah. and they don't want to get thrown out. So, um, you know, their donors, their alumni, their season ticket holders, you know, they, they don't want to get tossed out for being a jerk. Yeah, good point. Uh, you don't have to name names, but are there games that you're getting ready to ref at the D1 level where you're like, oh, I like that coach? And are there also, on the flip side, games where you see the the teams, you're like, ah, oh, it's going to be that guy on me all games? I think that that's, that's human nature. That, yeah. yeah, you know, there there are just people that are that are nicer than others or easier to work with than uh, than others you just go into it and and i'm sure that the that the coaches when they see the referees that are that are that are working their games they may think the same thing oh this guy or oh this person here you know it's just personalities and sometimes personalities don't really jive but um we, we still have a job to uh, do and most importantly we have to be fair okay i'm putting you on the spot here and you might not know the answer to this but nba right i went to my first nba playoff game uh, in denver sat courtside and got to see the Nuggets and Timberwolves up close. And sure. I haven't been to an NBA game that close in decades. And only this time was I paying attention to the physicality of the game. And every play, people are getting mauled. And then you'll see a touch foul get called. Now, I don't know how much you know about the NBA refing, but what's the logic on calling an NBA game? My logic, Jason, would be that you could probably call a foul on every single play, and you got to pick and choose. But what is your thoughts on calling NBA physicality? I think that's exactly right. It's it's contact. It's illegal contact versus contact, um, and offense initiated contact versus defense initiated contact. And it's really what's illegal and what's not, and what impacts the play and what doesn't. It's kind of like they say holding in football, right? We can call yeah. holding on every single play. Uh, we can call a foul. I can find a foul on every single play, pretty much. I can find something, but. That's the art of the game in getting a flow, having under, understanding of, you know, how the game is moving and what we have been calling before. So we don't all, all of a sudden have, you know, a carry with two minutes to go in the game, unless it's egregious. 
um, you know, that, and we haven't had one the whole game, you know. Uh, so it's just really under, understanding that and what can we get away with to keep the flow of the game going. And when you watch a game on TV, are you watching the refing? Are you watching the game? Are you watching both? How do you view a game? Yeah, uh, being a ref now has ruined how I watch <laughs> basketball. Um, from when you know my kids are playing, uh, all the way through just 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 watching it as a casual fan. Um, uh, yeah, it's really hard. Uh, NBA, I can watch a little bit more. I'm not a huge NBA fan, uh, but I can watch a little bit more. Uh, just observing it um, just as a fan rather than college. I, I can't really watch a college basketball game without dissecting everything that the referees are doing um, and, and and trying to learn myself and get better, you know? So it's, so it's that too. Like I'm watching what they do, you know, to learn both ways. Hey, I don't like that. So don't do that. Or I really like what he or she does. So I, I'm going to try to put that into my game. Gotcha. All right. It's August uh, 24th right now. Do you have a contract to ref D1 next season? Uh, I have a couple. So we okay. are year by year. So you know, we, we are one year renewable contracts. So um, every year I go into the off season, uh, not working for anybody. Um, and then, you know, you kind of hope that nothing really bad happened that you're, that you're going to get, you know, retained for the following year. And no, I think that that's the case. So I have I have a couple contracts. It's just a timing thing. Um, so some other contracts just haven't gone out to anybody. So it's not like I'm in danger right now. But um, so yeah, there's a couple that have been out. Okay, okay. Now we're gonna move to personal side. Now, where did you grow up? So I grew up in uh, just outside of Albany, New York, uh, in a town called Niskayuna. Um. And uh, so I grew up there my whole life and then, uh, you know, graduated from Niskayuna High School and then went off to college. That's right. And you played football at Colgate, right? I did. Yes. How did you end up choosing Colgate? What were your other options and why did you end up choosing Colgate? Uh, other options were James Madison, Georgetown, uh, Princeton. Um, we're going back a while. So you're testing my memory. <laughs> uh where else? I think off the top of my head, it was Colgate and then those other three, James Madison, Georgetown and Princeton. Um, and it came down to, you know, playing sports. It came down to academics. It came down to really, you know, my opportunities, the alumni network and how strong it was after college. I think that that's a huge thing that people don't um, investigate. And Colgate, even though it's a smaller school, the alumni network, I think because it's so small, it's so strong. Um, and you can really, uh, I can call somebody now and, you know, they can help me out. It's, it, it may not be to give me a job, but they can help help me out in some way and they'd be happy to. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. I, I like just finding out, Jason, about people's decision processes sure. on how they end up picking the schools they go to. And every story is different, but every year you're around and I'm around that kids have choices and they got to make a, a decision that's going to change their life trajectory. So I always like hearing people's kind of origin story on how they did that. And and now we're going to move to your oldest son who ended up going to a prep school. And I want to, I want to back up and figure out like, um, when did it first pop in your head that, Hey, maybe prep school is an option. And once you learned about that world, how did you go about just figuring out which prep school would be the right fit for him? So, prep school started to become a thought in my, so he went to a private school, Albany Academy here in Albany. Um, and very good school, um, very good program, you know, uh, uh, you know, routinely, you know, winning and sending kids off to college. Um, and it was a situation where through AAU, he was playing with a lot of kids and they were going off to prep school and they're doing really well. And, you know, all these kids are chasing offers. It really came, you know, that that was a big thing. And it was like, you know, well, why isn't Ray, my son, getting offers? And, you know, you got to really look at it as a as a as a basketball person. And this is this is no knock on anybody. But for the most part in high school, now he's six, three, very athletic, jumps well. And for his high school, he was kind of playing the four you know so he's playing a power forward he's guarding guys that are much bigger than him six 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 seven you know and he's holding his own he's setting screens he's on the bottom block for free throws rebounding you know and that's what they needed to win and I don't knock it one bit 
Um, and if he had no aspirations to play in college, he would have stayed there. And it would have been totally fine. He would have been happy. They won a state championship his sophomore year. He would have been, it, it, was, it was totally, it, it would have been fine. But having a conversation with him, he wanted to play in college. And that didn't translate to college. Even at the D3 level, you're not being at 6'3", you're not playing the power forward. It's just not happening now. Um, you know, so it kind of came to, okay, look at the school. What do they have? Who's, who's coming up? Can he change to playing a guard? And it really didn't seem like that was going to be an option. Like he was going to kind of stay in his role. That's what they needed for, for the team to win. So it became now let's figure out where to go to next. Um, so, you know, I called um, a couple of friends of mine who are some coaches and say, hey, listen, you know, talk to me about prep schools. Because in Albany, there aren't like it's not a prep school hotbed. There aren't really prep schools around here. There's the Hoosack School, which is about 25, 30 minutes away from us. Then the next closest school is probably in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is an hour and 20 minutes. So we don't have any, um, you know, we don't have any really any framework to understand what the prep school process was. And kids that went, there was only a couple that went to prep school and they were postgrads out of this area. So actually my son was the first, I believe, non-postgrad to go to prep school out of this area that I know of. Um, so yeah, I just started talking to college coaches and say, Hey, listen, you know, tell, you know, tell me about these schools, what the process is. And then, you know, give me some numbers of some guys. And I just started to call them up and kind of just did my research online. So that's a great thing. So you asked college coaches and what schools kind of repeatedly came up that you started researching? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, listen, first of all, my, my oldest son, all my kids, but my oldest son's very intelligent. So academics, we're not going to be, we're, we're not going to skimp on, on that by any means. So we were looking at schools we visited and, and looked at Northfield Mount Hermon, Cheshire Academy, St. Andrews, um, Suffield Academy. Um, uh, there was one other. Oh, we um, Blair. We talked to Blair as well. Um, so, you know, it was just, you know, we're not going to skimp on academics. That's not that's a non negotiable. So that's how that's how. So where are the schools that have high academic standards? and have good basketball. And you ended up choosing Cheshire Academy and coach Kevin Kehoe. So of all those schools, which are great options and all a little bit different in their own ways, what were the factors that, you know, made Cheshire the ultimate choice? Um, great academics, mm -hmm. um, number one. Um, also, the opportunity to play. Um, and, you know, you know, Kevin, Kevin said flat out, it, listen, if I need you to guard somebody six, six or six, seven, if I need you to jump center, if I need you to rebound and block shots, then I'm going to get fired. You know, I have six, nine, six, 10, seven feet, um, you know, to do that. You're going to play guard. That's what you are. That's what is going to translate to college at whatever level. And, um, you know, you're going to have the opportunity to play and I'm going to push you. And you're going to compete and, you know, it's up to you to ultimately succeed, but all those things are going to be there. Awesome. And how was his experience at Cheshire? How'd that end up? Phenomenal. Phenomenal. It, 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 it couldn't have gone any better. I mean, he, you know, Ray got there, um, you know, immediately got into the, into the weight room, you know, it immediately was playing against kids and listen, his high school was very, very talented, but Every kid on his team. So he reclassed. He was a junior when he left Albany Academy. He reclassed and was a junior again. So he was at Cheshire for two years. Every kid that went that played on Cheshire for his two years played in college at some level. Yeah. Um, so he's practicing and playing against college basketball players every day. And, you know, even at his very, very talented high school, he didn't have that. Um, you know, he was playing against, you know, some kids and, the, you know, he's on the first team, the second team, you know, it, it, it's not that much of a challenge. Whereas the third team at any prep school, but, spe but specifically Cheshire was challenging and pushing yeah. him. And, um, you know, he started most games, but some games, he, you know, some games he didn't start because somebody else did, did better that week. So, you know, and that, that was, um, so he had the opportunity to play and play guard and, even some coaches that had seen him at his previous school came up and said to me, when we saw him, his game didn't translate to college. And now his game does. 
We didn't know that he shoots the ball the way that he shoots it. We didn't know he handles the ball the way the way that he handles it. And you know, now it translates. Now we see it. Yeah, that's great. Is there something that he gained out of prep school that you got that's aside from basketball that you guys didn't even expect that was kind of a surprise? Like, oh, he now is better at this, or he now does this. He became a gym rat. Interesting. He was. He was. I mean, you know, he worked out. He 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 definitely worked out, but. He became a gym rat in two ways. He became a gym rat in the weight room and he became a gym rat in on the basketball court where, you know, we, I'd bring him to workouts. He'd go and work out. He'd go and do this now, like, and then, and then it translated to college. Couldn't get him out of the gym. You know, he probably gained 25 pounds and that's part of maturity as well. But, uh, you know, and he just worked on his game because everybody was there playing. And if you don't work on your game, you know, uh, you're going to get left behind. Yeah, love it. And he ended up choosing Penn, just like you. Walk me through his options and why he ultimately chose Penn. Yeah, he had, so Ray went from, as a junior, zero offers at when he was at his uh, old high school to, I believe it was 14 offers in one year. And that's not necessarily normal, but again, his he showed that his game translated. And he's super athletic um, and he could shoot it and he can get to the basket and he gained weight and all that stuff. But so he had a lot of options. And then listen, not all not all offers are, you know, are an option either. But yeah. when it came down to it, he he gained some more offers uh, that summer. Then his, then his senior year, he had some more. When it came down to it, we were looking at Bucknell, Holy Cross, Penn, um, Fordham. Uh, I think those were like the final four per se. And again, it came down to similarly with, with uh, me, it came down to, okay, you know, academics, we're not going to choose. And those are four academically phenomenal schools. Um, you know, it, it, so you're not going to skimp on that again. What are his opportunities after college? What's the alumni network like all that stuff. And what are his chances to play? Um, you know, what are his options to play? You know, um, you know, as I told him, you could be a kid and, you know, through through coach, through me, through whomever, you know, I can, I can get we can get you to Duke and you can sit on the bench for four years. Right. If that's what you want, just, you know, we can call some people up and work it out and maybe it'll happen. So, you know, I'm just using Duke, but you know, we can get you to somewhere and you can sit up if that's what you want to go to the highest level possible and never play. If that's what you want, then that's fine, because that's fine for some kids, but not for my son. He wanted to play and he wanted to fight for a job and compete. And um, ultimately, you know, the, you know, similar things with choosing uh, Cheshire. He had the opportunity to play for Steve Donahue at Penn. And, um, you know, they won the Ivy League and went to the NCAA tournament. And, you know, um, those were the factors. Awesome. That's a great story. Now, your younger son yep. is currently at prep school. Tell me about his decision-making process, how you might have done it differently this time, and then where he ended up. Well, it was definitely different because I had so much more of a framework right. as to prep schools. Like, you know, years and years of experience now talking to coaches and, you know, um, understanding, you know, what goes into the whole, the whole process. And, um, you know, so that was a huge advantage. Uh, it really kind of whittled out some of the, well, what about here? What about this? Or what about that? And, you know, um, and so he ended up, uh, we looked at, um, it, it came down to two schools. It came down to Loomis Chafee and it came to, and, and, uh, Winchin did, um, no coincidence, uh, rock Battistoni at Loomis, uh, was Ray's old assistant coach when he was at Cheshire and Kevin Keogh at Winchenden was Ray's old head coach at Cheshire. So a very good familiarity with both guys, two phenomenal guys, um, great coaches, um, and people I trust. I mean, you're really trusting your 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 child with somebody. Um, so I so I I trust them when because I'm not going to be there. You know, um, you know their mom is not going to be there. So you know I trust them with my kids. Love it, love it, and have that experience. Oh, he's still Winston right now, right? So he uh, he will be going to Winchin in in um, two weeks. Gotcha. Two weeks. So yeah. So he will be a junior at Winchin. The they, they have to be there uh, Wednesday, September sixth. 
Gotcha. Awesome. And I got a couple kids going there this year too. So they'll be teammates. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, I want to bounce into what we connected on, which is the showcase events that you run. So give everyone listening out there um, kind of a rundown on, you know, what your event is, why you started it and what the benefit of it is. Right. So the event is the Northeast prep school showcase. And, um, what it is, is it's a prep, it's a showcase event for high school players, eighth grade through seniors who want to go to prep school and play basketball in prep school and for the prep school coaches to come and evaluate a captive audience of players that want to go to prep school. So you're not going to an AAU tournament. You're not going to a team camp or something like that and saying, hey, I, I really like that kid. Does he want to go to prep school? Then you have to start this whole process of, I don't know. I don't know what prep school is. I don't know what this. These kids want to go to prep school. Um, so and, and these coaches can now come and recruit, uh, you know, this captive audience of, of uh, kids. How it started is because of my son, Ray. We started this process and had no idea what to uh, do. In fact, we started his first visit to a prep school. We went to Northfield Mount Hermon um, Martin Luther King Day weekend because he didn't have high school practice. Um, so it's so we're talking G, like the middle to end of January. Um, and then find out applications are due February the 15th at that time. So it's like, wow, like we have a month and we're just starting this process and have no idea, like we had no clue. So it was like, okay. So we kind of hurried through this whole process. And the process is applications and recommendations and transcripts and all this stuff that you have to get quickly um, and try not to upset the apple cart at your current high school, which is another song and dance to have to deal with. And I can talk about that. But, um, you know, so now he goes off to prep school and he's doing he's pretty successful. And he like I said, I think he's the first kid to leave this area early. And all of a sudden I'm getting emails and text messages and phone calls from people I don't even know. Hey, I got your number from such and such. Uh, my son wants to go to prep school. Is it, you know, it's, it's now September or it's August and school starts. Hey, is it, is it too late? Or, Hey, my son has an offer to go to X school. Can they go to prep school for free? And I just started thinking like, everybody is in the same boat that I am. They have no clue in this area, how the prep school process works. So then I called Kevin and I called rock and I said, Hey, is there like a showcase event that you guys go to to recruit prep schools, like just for kids that want to go to prep school? And they're like, no, there was a couple other things, but there's like, no, like specifically for that. I go, so what if I started one? And they said, well, that would be a great idea. So then I, I started to think, okay, well, how can I appeal to everybody at my event? Cause I've been to a ton of showcase things and it's just, it's a, it's a money grab and they roll the basketballs out and the kids play five on five and nobody passes. And, you know, if you're lucky to be on a good team that wins some games, maybe some coaches see you cause they share the ball a little bit more. And, you know, you just kind of, kind of got to get lucky. So I said, well, how do I structure this event to appeal to everybody? So number one, the parents and the guardians. So we do a one hour um, parent coach round table discussion up in a conference room where we have a panel of experts. We have um, a prep school parent. We have a prep school player. We have a prep school coach. We have a college coach. And we have somebody else who's like a keynote speaker um, who um, there's, or, or just like a, just like a keynote person to answers any and all questions that the parents have about the prep school process. Ranging from my son's never been gone from home before. Uh, what are, what's, what's room, what, you know, what are the roommates like? He doesn't know how to do his laundry. He doesn't know how to iron his clothes. Uh, um, what's the admissions process like? Uh, you know, I, you know, my son takes all AP classes. Can they challenge him at prep school with the course curriculum? Um, you know, what's basketball like? Will he get a scholarship? I mean, all these things that these people can really, you know, answer and, 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 you know, um, help guide parents who don't know about the process. Um, while that roundtable discussion is going on, we have a workout. So we have a trainer come in 
and the players, the, all the other coaches are down evaluating the, uh, the players go through a workout where they're doing, you know, shooting drills, passing drills, dribbling drills, two on two, three on three to show their skills so that nobody can say, Hey, I didn't shoot the ball in front of the coach in my five on five game. So they, so he can't see whether I'm good or not. He can't see whether I can pass the ball or not because they do all these drills for one hour and they play small sided games um, to show their skills. Everybody gets touches. Everybody, you know, gets, gets to do what they can uh, do. Then after that, we have um, the last two years, we've been um, blessed to uh, have Gatorade be involved. So, so Gatorade comes in, they do a, a hydration presentation on the, uh, for the uh, kids. And then that's like a little 15, 20 minute break between the workout and then they play five on five. So they'll, so they'll do somewhere from an hour to an hour and 15 minutes of five on five, 20 minute running clock. We don't keep score because it's not about who's winning and losing. And I implore everybody to share the basketball. Um, we don't, you know, it's not here to come in. Coaches don't want to see you dribble it 57 times. Um, and they, and, and now they play five on five. So it's, you know, they're, so the parents get something, the coaches get something, the players get training, they get, you know, stuff from like Gatorade, and then they get to play a lot of basketball and show and showcase their, their skills. Love it. And what have you seen over the years? Has this been successful? Have a lot of kids been placed out of this? Yeah. So we placed, I got to do, so there's still some kids actually committing and just kind of going in like, like this last couple of weeks. So I have oh, to yeah. do the numbers, but um, we have placed, it's between 25 and 30% of the kids that have come to our showcase have gone on to prep school. Uh, and we range somewhere between 50 and 70 kids at each event. Since 2018, we only missed the one year, 2020, because of COVID. Um, so the pandemic shut us down for that year, but every other year. So with those numbers, we've, you know, somewhere between 50 and 70 kids, we've placed 25 to 30% of them. Not we've placed them. They have gone on to prep school. Right. And what's your ultimate goal for this? What would you ideally like to do with this? I mean, I would love to, you know, cap this at 80 kids because it's not about having, you know, 400 kids and just doing this, you know, it, it's not for that, you know, yeah. have this be very competitive, get in, cap it at 80 kids and probably do a couple of these across the country. That's what I would really love to love to do. Maybe, you know, you know, two on the East coast, one in the Midwest, one on the West coast, or I don't know how it all breaks down, but I would love to do a couple of these across the country and be a destination for players and coaches Player, pl players who want to go to prep school and coaches who want to recruit kids that want to go to prep school. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. We've talked about that. We're going to talk about that more on scene if we can get, like you said, different locations. Sure. And families, if you might not know this or not, but you might say, why would a coach in the East Coast go to the Midwest? Well, they want to get fresh blood, right? They don't just want kids from New England. They want to get kids from all over the country. And there's a lot of kids over the, around the country, especially as you go west of New England, that have never heard of prep school. And that's been part of my mission at Prep Athletics is just letting everyone letting everyone know around the world, this isn't for everybody, but it is an option that exists. Learn more about it. Absolutely. And, you know, these coaches, they've got, there's money in the admission department to send these coaches to events like this, right? Yeah. So, you know, with Jason having the event already on the East Coast, if a coach gets a chance to come to Denver or LA or Seattle and word gets out there, it's going to be a great option for these kids. And there's no guarantee that they're going to get an offer out of this. But all you can ask for in this world is exposure, right? Is a right. chance. Just an opportunity, right? Yeah. And there's 90%, if not more, of the high school kids in America never play in front of a, a college coach during their high school career. So that's all you can ask for is exposure. Um, I love this. We It's August. Uh, this will be out in the beginning of September um, of 2023. Tell us about you know your event coming up where it is, where people can sign up for it. Um, if they need to reach you, all the information they would need, Jason. Sure. Sure. So um, you can, you can easily go. So our, you can Google Northeast prep school showcase. The website is www.showcaseevents.com. Um, and uh, you can register now on our website. Uh, the event this year will be held at Hudson Valley community college, which is in Troy, New York, just outside of Albany. Uh, we have a host hotel for anybody that needs to come in. There's a discount code under hotels on our website. Um, 
and uh, it is held uh, Sunday, October 1st uh, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Registration is from 9.30 to 10, so check-in registrations from 9.30 to 10. We really don't want, if possible, any walk-ins because what we do is when you register, that goes into a roster. So the roster, you have your, your name, your school, your height, your weight, you're willing to reclassify, yes or no, uh, all that stuff. And then we print that roster out and that roster goes to the prep school coaches. So Corey, you could register first and you'll get number one because you registered first and you're six foot nine, you know, 225 pounds, but you're going to get Jersey number, number one. And somebody that's five foot 10, 150 pounds registers 50th. They're going to get Jersey number 50. Sure. But so now the coach looks at the roster and says, wow, number one's really killing it. Who is that kid? Rather than asking somebody who the, who the, who the kid is, they have a roster in front of them of every player that's there. It's kind of like the live period where these yeah. coaches pay for these packets of rosters of teams. It's the same, it's the same concept. And if someone nationwide wants to talk to you about potentially having one of these events in their hometown, sure. I, I'm advocating they should reach out to you, Jason, because this Absolutely. is an opportunity. If you're say you're an AU coach or you run an event, like there's a guy in Denver that runs a 10 court event center, right? What a great way to get teams and coaches families sell concessions it's a win-win for everybody so anyone out there that has a connection or might want to talk to jason about bringing this um i i i have a good feeling within the next few years it's going to be a nationwide brand and the more people learn about prep school which they're doing every single day of the year more and more people are learning about this option more and more families i think there's potential to make this still boutique and still quality but just getting out there beyond new england and new york to other parts of the world. And my gosh, Jason, there's no what reason this couldn't go international at some point. Doing a Caribbean, Absolutely. doing it in Toronto, Absolutely. you know, going to uh, Shanghai, going to Paris. Um, so I think this is great. And, you know, we talk about this, uh, the staff at the round table, you know, the reason I want to have you on as well, is I'm going to be there this year to actually share, you know, share what little, um, little information I can piggyback on top of your other uh, speakers you're going to have. But I'm excited to see this event, see my friends out of the prep school coaches, meet new families. And, you know, if it goes well, absolutely be singing your praises about this because this is a need out yes. there for a lot of families, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, we can be contacted on our website. We can be contacted through our social media at Showcase Events, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. Um, you can reach out to me. If you can't reach me for any reason, reach out to Corey. Yeah, Corey has all of all of my uh, numbers, contact information. Um, anything, you know, uh, you know, feel free to contact me with any questions. I'd be happy to help anybody in any sort of way, get to our event. Love it. Is there anything we didn't discuss in our conversation you want to touch on Jason? Man. Um, Would it be refing your children, your event? We might have covered know, everything. Yeah. I, th I think we pretty much covered everything. And, and yeah, if there's any other questions, I mean, feel free to reach out, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think we missed anything. All right, we're going to finish up with a quick, quick lightning round, okay? Okay. Okay. All right, the best player you ever played against, either in basketball or football. Oof, best player I ever played against, man. Um, so my cousin is James Thomas, who went to Texas and then played in the NBA. He's about six nine. Uh, he played for Rick Barnes at Texas. I would say he's probably the best player that I ever played against. I can think about off the, off the top of my head. Gotcha. At the D1 level, um, when you've been coaching, what's the single most, uh, what's the best performance you've ever refed? I don't know how, I'm, I'm not saying that right. What player had the best performance in a game you refed that you can remember? I'm trying to remember who, what, it, I refed a game, a kid had 42 points and uh, he, he came out of a timeout and he just goes, man, ref, I can't miss tonight. And, and uh, I don't remember his name is slipping me right now, but he was just on fire. Probably fun to witness, huh? Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Have you ever refed a game where a brawl happened? No, thank God. Okay, good, good. <laughs> no, that 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 is not what. Yeah, I don't want any fights. I don't want any. The, when you hear dun 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 dun, 
referee Jason. Like, I don't want to be on Sports Center yeah. for, for any of that. I just want to do my game under the radar, go on to like the next one. I don't want, you know, no, yeah, I don't, that is, yeah. Thank, thankfully, there have been no brawls. Okay. Which favorite movie of all time? Ooh, Hoosiers. Oh, yeah. Good, good answer. You know, I actually saw that at a special premiere in Indiana like six months before it came out. And really? it was at Thanksgiving. So our whole family, which is all basketball players, That's went nice. to watch it in some small little hillbilly uh, theater in Indiana. And it was beautiful. Just still That's beautiful. Awesome. Still beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, it still comes on this day and I have to just watch it. Yeah. Coach Norman Dale. And in fact, fun fact, you go to Knightstown, Indiana, you can actually go, which is like 20 miles east of Indy. You can walk in the gym. They filmed Hoosiers in it's like always open. There's always old leather balls in the court, and, and you can just start getting up shots. There's no admission fee, nothing. That oh, needs to be I, a spot to hold one of your events. Done. Done. Oh my done. gosh, they had it. They had an Indiana All Star game there once, Indiana Ohio, and when Greg Oden was playing. So, okay. you know, there's no seats in there, and it's a small court, and you got Greg Oden and their All Stars playing some other All Stars. So, why not have showcase events? indiana style like people would come from far and wide to do that let's let's do it uh, listen th- have have game will travel. travel yes for sure all right we're brainstorming here live all right uh <laughs> last but not least hobbies when you're not doing all the good stuff you do what are your hobbies man uh i love the golf um i uh golfing exercise uh hanging with my kids uh, those are probably my three hobbies um uh, but I've really, uh, now that my kids are a little bit older, I have a little more free time. I can kind of leave them a little bit more to kind of, you know, fend for themselves for a couple hours. And I've been really golfing a lot this, uh, summer. So it's really, the bug has rebitten me and, uh, yeah, I, I love it. Well, that's great. Well, thanks for sharing all that. Everybody, if you enjoyed this podcast, thanks so much for tuning in. And if you really enjoyed it, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube or on any of the major podcasting platforms. If you've got any questions about prep school or the showcase event, please email me or Jason. Jason Bradwell, thank you so much for joining the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm excited to be at your event. I hope everyone that's in the area that's heard about it signs up. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, both as a referee and as a parent of prep school kids. And I think uh, this is a valuable uh, conversation we had today for plenty of people out there. Thank you, Corey. So happy to be here. Would love to do it anytime. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good day. Bye now.